Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> hey, 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 don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila. Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click. Get flexible payment options. Then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to support our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to The Next Reel. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. In just a matter of seconds, you're going to hear a classic episode of this show from back in the day when we called ourselves Movies We Like. It took us a while to settle into the show's format, so you'll notice some differences as you listen to these episodes. For instance, it takes us a bit of time to actually get into the conversation about the movie. Things like that. But we're still proud of the conversations about the movies themselves, and we think they're worth keeping in the library. So enjoy these episodes from our back catalog. And you can become part of our Discord community, learn more about the show, and find out how you can become a supporting member at thenextreel.com. So thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to The Next Reel. We appreciate your time and attention, and we hope you enjoy the show. What movies have you seen? Because we have to do the quick rundown of the movies. It's been like yeah. two weeks, two and a three weeks since I've talked to you. It's it has been quite a while. Seems like I'm doing all the talking right now. <laughs> Feels like I'm just throwing things out. <laughs> well, you missed a lot of movies. Yes, I'm trying to remember how far back how back it's been. Well, I definitely I think that our first weekend away was Mission Impossible. I still have not seen that. I can't believe it. it hit 300 million uh, worldwide this week or right now. Yes, uh, that's quite a bit of fun. Mission Impossible: Rogue Nation. Yeah. Um, 
and then are you are you with the uh, the rest of the universe says it's this may very well be the best of the series? No, but I'd say you know for me it's the second best. I still put Ghost Protocol up there, and I still really like the third one. But I think I like this one more than the third one. Okay. So, um, and then Southpaw, Mr. Holmes. Yep. Those, yep. those all came out. Those were really good. Excellent. I enjoyed those quite a bit. Are any of them Oscar worthy? Are we going to be talking about these? Uh, you know. You know, I I I don't think so. I, I you know I think there are enough story problems um, with Southpaw where it uh, it will it if anything it would be remembered for another uh, great Jake Gyllenhaal performance. But I don't know if the film's going to since it's a summer film. I don't know if the film's going to have the uh, retention in people's minds when it comes mm-hmm. time for Oscar picks. Okay. Um, Ian Holm, I think, was great in Mr. Holmes, and he could get a nomination just because it's really fun just seeing him play Sherlock Holmes. I I had heard life. I had heard the uh, from before the film came out. I had heard some early critics say that it was a snoozer, that it was just boring. Did you mm-hmm. share that? I didn't. I I thought it was actually quite uh, a quite fun film to watch. Really. Um, good character piece. I, I really enjoyed him. I enjoyed him as Sherlock Holmes. I think he did a great job. Mm-hmm. I, I did like it. Okay. All right. Anything else? And then I saw Sean the Sheep movie with the family. And Man, that was, I uh, heard that's a slamming good movie. That's quite a bit of fun. Lots of fun. The kids had a blast. So I definitely recommend that, uh, especially for the younger folk. All right. Well, I, I saw a bunch on uh, on in my travels. Um uh, a few, first of all, you know, I went to Chautauqua in, in New York, and you know how we usually do the uh, Chautauqua classic film series. They have the old theater, and they put a classic film in there. You know what the classic film was this year? I uh, don't. I didn't even go. How about that? You want to know why? It sounds like it wasn't that much of a classic. The Horse Whisperer. <laughs> wow. Uh, okay. Maybe if a 10-year-old is picking movies now, that could be maybe... <laughs> considered a cla- not even not even uh remotely close to interested in seeing that. I was very disappointed. Um yeah, but uh but I did see okay so the fr- I became obsessed obsessed with the ruins. Oh. And we yes. talked about this cuz I I started with the book. The book was fantastic. It was just really awful and scary. And so then after yeah, you know I when finished you say the book, awful you mean awful in the in the best sort of Yes, way. exactly. It was just <laughs> it's just horrible. And so then if and I know you said you had seen the movie. I I actually went and immediately downloaded the movie and watched it overnight one night while everybody was sleeping. And uh it was it was pretty good. It it was you know, it was okay in terms of a horror movie, but I just coming off the book, I couldn't get it out of my head. It was just awesome. Um, and so I saw that. That was that was a marginally good film. Uh, I then saw Maggie, the the Schwarzenegger zombie Sh- movie. Schwarzenegger zombie movie. You seen that? I didn't. It's it's really it's really strange. I'm still sort of kind of trying to figure out what my opinion is of that film. Generally, I think it is a it's a great opportunity to watch uh, uh, Schwarzenegger and uh, Breslin. Uh, you know, do essentially a movie about nothing. Like there's huh. just, there's, there's not a lot to it. Um, it, it is, you know, I, I get there's a father daughter experience to it. Uh, it wasn't that strong of a father daughter experience. It was kind of a pretty movie. The color tone was, was, you know, captured the universe that I was, um, I was interested in, but it, it felt super long. It really felt long. It just, uh, Really? really long by the end of it. So then, so then I went and I uh, caught Project Almanac. This is another one that was a trailer pick from one of us some years back. Right, a while uh, back. Yeah. Time travel. Time travel, and uh, that one was a lot of fun. I actually, I, I had a, a good time watching that one. Uh, and so I think it's, it's worth the, the late night rental. I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, it, it doesn't do uh, anything with time travel that we haven't necessarily seen, but it. It's flashy and fun, and the kids are good. So, and it's a it's a uh, first person camera sort of film, right? Yeah, yeah, and they do a, they do a pretty good job of that too. You know, of of keeping fidelity to the to the uh, first person. I I uh, I, I enjoyed that. So, okay. I, you know, I'm not saying it's uh, I'm not saying it's, you know I'm not gonna not gonna win anything huge, but uh, but it, it was fun, and and again, the kids were 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 pretty good. There are some good. Um, there's a good relationship loop in it 
that that I think they execute really well, and and uh, so it's kind of a it's a fun love story that kind of goes out of control. Ah, uh, good. Yeah, worth seeing. Uh, okay, we've got some blot spots. This it was a it was a big week. I think you should read the. I'll read the one for volunteers, okay. and you read the one for <laughs> Under the Cherry Moon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, the volunteers blot spot. The accent was cringeworthy, and I agree with Pete that Tom Hanks was just too likable to play someone so unlikable. Also, Pete touched on it but didn't press the point. The plot needed better conflict. It takes all the impact out of the pink menace and the warlord when everybody wants the same thing. I would disagree with him on that point. However, any movie with John Candy gets big comedy bonus points. Every one of his scenes was amazing, and I love when his character's I love when characters break the fourth wall in a comedy. Best moment of the film for me. Your rank, 168 out of 195. My rank, 158 out of 195. <laughs> so we were pretty close. We were pretty yeah. close on that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I think the bigger news out of our volunteers review mm-hmm. is that is that we uh, we were picked up by uh, the, the good and kind Ken Levine. Right. Writer of volunteers who said who wrote a blog post back on august 5th on his own website about how he is a guilty pleasure and uh he wrote uh, rather extensively about our podcast about him and um you know uh it was it was really i, I mean it was good i think his what did you think of that when you when you read his writing about you Oh, I thought it was great. I mean, you know, if you're putting stuff out there like this, I mean, of yeah. course, you're always you're always going to be getting feedback. It's great getting it from one of the writers. I mean, he's getting feedback on his own project. And, you know, everybody's a critic. So we're yeah. criticizing him. He's criticizing our podcast. What are you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I love that. Uh, I love this part. Uh, they're currently doing a series called Guilty Pleasures. Uh, Andy selected volunteers. Thanks, Andy, I think, because after he talks about how funny and enjoyable it was, he and his partner systematically tear the film apart. <laughs> <laughs> Makes me wonder what they do to movies they didn't like. Well, <laughs> lest we move on uh, to Under the Cherry Moon, uh, which uh, was just last week's show. If you haven't listened to it, you really um, probably shouldn't. Don't listen to that show. Uh, it, 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 this is uh, what uh, from uh, the blot spot. I, eight months ago, I equated watching The Exorcist to sitting through two hours of nails on a chalkboard and said people liking it was as odd as people who like shoving toothpicks under their fingernails. That being said, I'd rather watch The Exorcist again than Under the Cherry Moon. It very well might be the worst movie I have ever seen. At least you admitted it, Pete, because that was painful, and watching that kissing almost made me physically ill. I do believe Pete wins the award for guiltiest pleasure of all time. Your rank, 196 out of 196. My rank, unsurprisingly... 196 out of 196. <laughs> yeah. It was not a it was not a good movie and the kissing. God. Yes, there was painful Maybe kissing. If there had been just a little bit more um enticing softcore porn. <laughs> <laughs> it was really bad. It's oh, really yeah. tough to watch. Yep. Uh so anyhow, that's follow up on our guilty pleasures. The only other thing oh, to oh, add to that wait. I think is what one more follow-up is yeah. we are probably going to be doing a re- an interview soon with Ken Levine. That's what I was going to say. You, it's like you're reading my mind. Wow. Well, you're you're wrapping up. I thought you were done with Guilty Pleasures. Well, that's what I said. There's one more thing to say. That was going to oh. be my one more thing. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Finish it off. So part of Ken Levine <laughs> posting <laughs> about us is that he reached out to talk more about it and now we're going to be doing an interview with him to chat more about not just volunteers but also his uh, rather lengthy uh, uh, career uh, particularly as a as a TV writer Cheers and Mash and uh, Frasier being uh, three of the TV shows that he's most well known for this may be the thing I regret the most about our conversation on volunteers is that we didn't talk more about his work in television. And I think that's just we're biased because we're talking about movies. But uh, as much as I wasn't crazy about volunteers, I adore his television work. Uh, and so it's it's going to be good fun to to talk about that. And I'm not just saying that because, you know, critics. Right. <laughs> uh, what do you think? Any other any other follow up on your end before we jump in? To the big uh, show? W- well, we have uh, some iTunes reviews from around the world. Oh, hey. Yeah, you did the yeoman's work going to iTunes page after iTunes page. 
it's a little bit of work tracking down iTunes reviews from people in different countries because unfortunately iTunes doesn't uh, kind of aggregate it all into one place. It all is uh, in individual country pages. So I poked around uh, the interwebs looking for different reviews and I thought we'd re read a few of them. So um, from our listener, Brendan Roberts, down in Australia, he said, technical movie reviews done well. A great mix of social commentary and technical movie reviews. Unique format that is at its best when the hosts utterly disagree. Knowing is a good episode reference for this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I love that uh, we jump right back into the guilty pleasures. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fantastic. That's awesome. Thank you, Brendan. Um, then this is from our uh, wonderful listeners in uh, in Sweden. Oh, Sweden. We, we, we need to do a meetup in Sweden. Seriously. That would be a blast. That would be a blast. Oh. Uh, this is from A.V. Jungland, I think. Hands down, the best film podcast out there. Film buff? Never seen a film? Doesn't matter. You should all listen to this. That's uh, Mr. Tilkvist, which we, uh, we know and love. Oh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Tilkvist. And then uh, Jonathan Blomberg uh, said, I'll be back, as Arnold would say. An absolute joy to listen to. They go the extra mile and review both new and old movies. So if you want to get the latest reviews of new theater releases like every other movie podcast, you will get it here too. But you will also get a whole lot of oldies that went under the radar because of the lack of podcasts like this back in the day. <laughs> that is true. That's what we do. <laughs> yes, we, we're kind of all over the place. But uh, thank you, guys. We really appreciate your reviews. Um, heading on up to Canada. We've got uh, one review by, uh, looks like their name is just a bunch of jumbled letters, uh, who just says, five stars, great podcast, which we definitely like. And then another one, which is a two-star one, Pete. Oh. Yeah. No, it's my fault. I don't know if I should read it. <laughs> Go ahead and read it. <laughs> All right, from Mr. Jepp. Listening today, the hosts asked for reviews, so here you go. This podcast should be deeply interesting to me. I love the way they rediscuss old films and prep for new releases, Alien, Mad Max, etc. The guys are pretty smart. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> no, no a lot. <laughs> However, they really lack when it comes to their total dismissal of some films like Alien Resurrection. That's probably on me. <laughs> I like to hear differing opinions, but the hosts never explain their dislikes. They just hold forth and laugh smugly. That's not criticism. It's just fanboy fawning and in-joking. I'd love these topics with proper critics. Proper critics? Well, here, first of all, I have something to say about that. <laughs> we did a whole show on that stinking movie. Like, of course we're going to just smugly like, you know what? Go back into the deep catalog, don't you think? Anyway. I think they're... I would say, I mean, okay, I would say there may be some elements where we don't necessarily explain our dislikes. I agree with that. But, uh, and for that, I apologize. Yes, likewise. But I do think that we try when we have negative things to say about a film that we kind of explore, you know, the problems that we had with it. I, well, I like to think we do too. But I, in that specific example, because we did a whole show on it, I'm, I'm just a modicum of defensive uh, on that one because we did a whole <laughs> show on it and we explained very clearly where the troubles were. Yes. So that was probably not a good example to use. There, there may be others that are better. Yes, I think under the cherry moon, we actually had some good uh, analysis. <laughs> <laughs> Glad you brought it back. Under cherry moon may become our next knowing. The film that <laughs> just, always just comes back. It just might. Uh, uh, we got another one from Germany. Fun and interesting podcast. I came across this podcast, incidentally, and began to listen to the episodes about movies I, too, had seen. The fact that I burned through these episodes, often listening to 10 or more in a single week, kudos wow. to you. Wow. Says something about how much I enjoyed and still enjoy listening to Pete and Andy. They are knowledgeable hosts and do a great job at explaining to their audience why they like a movie and sometimes why they actually don't like it all that much. In, in violent disagreement with uh, who we just <laughs> talked about. <laughs> Highly recommended to anyone who enjoys not only watching movies, but also discussing them. Thank you very much. Von Podcast Addict 352. Oh, that's awesome. Indeed it is. Indeed it is. And uh, last but not least, we have another one from Great Britain. This is by Suicidal90, film potting at its finest. These gentlemen are amusing. I like that he called us gentlemen, or she called mm -hmm. us gentlemen. Mm -hmm. Informative and just great to listen to. I love the tangents. What? 
The story is the camaraderie between the hosts. I look forward to what may come. Keep up the great work and effort. It is not for naught. Oh, that is the that's the best. That is very kind to say that. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So I, I also look forward to what may come. <laughs> yes. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. Do you consider us critics? Well, I guess that's what we're doing. <laughs> I, think, I I when I first heard that, I thought, well, that's generous. <laughs> yeah, I've never, <laughs> I've never really thought about. It. I mean, I guess we, I would, I would say we're 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 likely not critics. We're we may be in orbit of of critics, but we critique, yeah, uh, in so far as you know cultural relevance and what we connect with. But I think it's, I think it may be a stretch to call us, you know, proper critics. Maybe that's why we're not proper critics. It's certainly nothing we get paid for. <laughs> no, no. So, uh, all right. Uh, I think we should probably uh, tell the people where we're from. Yeah, let's do it. Where are we from? Hey, everybody. This is The Next Reel. I'm Pete Wright, and that there is proper critic Andy Nelson. Hello. Here we spoil movies. Tonight on the show, listener's choice from across the Great Pond with Ruben Ostlin's avalanche comedy from 2014, Force Majeure. Before we get into that, you should learn more about us at thenextreel.com. Subscribe on iTunes or follow us on Twitter and Facebook at The Next Reel. And if you feel the constant shame of never living up to the expectations of your family and believe the only respite to be the icy maw of Mother Nature careening down the side of a mountain... You should head over to Instagram.com slash the next reel and play the next reel's Instagram hashtag pony prize hashtag guess the movie challenge with Steven. And for that, let's jump across the pond over to Scotland to Steve. Hey guys, Steven here. Good friend of the show at Glassed got it on image six this week. The movie was Entrapment from 1999, directed by John O'Neill, starring Catherine Zeta Jones and Sean Connery. So congrats at Glarsid, you are entered once again to win the Pony Prize. As always, a new challenge starts Friday, so thanks guys, and see you later. I think it's fantastic that uh, they're really pulling, like Sweden is really coming together for this particular episode. <laughs> I'm, th- uh, I'm starting to feel the urge to just move to Sweden. I feel like there's, there's orbit. <laughs> we need to, there's gravitational pull towards Scandinavia. I, I think that would be fantastic. That'll be our home away from home. <laughs> That's awesome. Congratulations, Gustav. Mm, Gustav. All right. Let's do trailers. Let's do it. My trailer is... Uh, I didn't even know that this was happening, but uh, it excites me because it's um, Brian Cranston who uh, really kind of, you know, kind of hit it big with, uh, with uh, you know, his little, his little, you know, that little drug TV show that he mm. did. See, kids, drugs can't make you rich. <laughs> that's right. Oh, that's not uh, true. <laughs> I take it back. Pete, shame uh, on you. Uh, but anyway, he is uh, in a new film coming out this November uh, called Trumbo, about Dalton Trumbo, the uh, screenwriter, great Hollywood screenwriter who was very successful, top of his game, when all of a sudden he was blacklisted as a communist in the 40s. And it put a big halt to his career and made a mess of his life and really, uh, you know, pushed him into a place where he really had to try to figure out how can he get out of this um, this place of being blacklisted and what does it mean and all that sort of stuff until, of course, um, good old uh, Kirk Douglas came along and asked him to write Spartacus and actually gave him credit, and that helped break the blacklist, which was fantastic. This looks at his life. It looks uh, great. I, I really love him as Trumbo. I think that uh, he's going to play it really well. Um, Diane Lane in, is his wife. She looks... Um, uh, unfortunately, I mean, I love Diane Lane. Just from the trailer, she looks like she's unfortunately falling into the the uh, kind of wife of the main character sort of uh, character, which happens so frequently to great actresses. They end up in these sorts of roles. I'm hoping there's more to it, but it doesn't look like it. It looks like Hedda Hopper, played by Helen Mirren, actually has a much bigger role, and I certainly hope so because she's always great. Elle Fanning is the daughter. Um, Ellen Tudyk is in it. Uh, John Goodman is in it. 
Uh, we've got Louis C.K., Stephen Root, Michael Stuhlbarg, um, Adewale Akinoye Akbaje is in it. It's a fantastic cast, and uh, it just, you know, it's a very... It's, it's relatively timey, timely. We had talked a little bit about the blacklist back in, uh, was it our noir series, I believe. And so um, I find the whole thing a very interesting uh, part of Hollywood history. And Trumbo also um, happened to go to University of Colorado at Boulder for a little while. And so um, there was quite a big uh, to-do when when we were in college there. Um, where they were naming the fountain after him, and uh, Douglas came out, and it was uh, it was a pretty cool little time. I helped out on that. Um, anyway, so I, I personally am quite fascinated by this story. I definitely want to see this movie. Jay Roach is directing it, which I think is the the thing about it that strikes me as the strangest element in the whole mix, coming off of you know the Austin Powers films, the Meet the Parents films. Um, that's the only thing that really is weird to me. <laughs> I, I, you know, it's funny. Tonally, the trailer looks terrific, and and it yeah. doesn't. You're right. I mean, it it does not look like a Jay Roach uh, film. Absolutely not. I think uh, the guy uh, he has such a knack for comedy. Uh, really, I mean, but uh, the Meet the Parents uh, films, the I uh, Austin Powers, that he has he has a real knack for that kind of. Um, that kind of of work but he's also i mean he's got a, a number of of credits as producer that that have him moving in a, a very different direction um and and so uh, you know i'm looking forward to it i think it's i think he's going to i think he's going to do a great job with it i'm i think it's wonderful i haven't seen um the campaign uh which was the the uh will ferrell i i didn't uh, as far as i remember it didn't do that great I don't think it did. Um, it, it looked kind of funny initially, but then as it drew closer, I just kind of lost interest. Dinner for Schmucks, meh, it was all right. I mean, Mystery Alaska may be the closest. You know, it, it, it was a little more of a drama comedy, mm-hmm. you know, kind of a real world sort of story. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I don't know. I mean, I I'm from the trailer, I mean, you wouldn't even be able to tell that no. it's the person who did Meet the Parents or Austin Powers doing this. Right. Um, I think it... Uh, Looks like he really has a, a strong handle on what he's t- doing with this story. Yeah, uh, it's, it it you know, uh, it's a pivot piece. I I love it. I think it's very exciting. I, I look forward to uh, look forward to checking it out. When's it hit? Um, it's it's a limited release listed right now for November sixth. So we'll see. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, it'll get a little bit wider. All right. Uh, my trailer is one I've been looking forward to for a long, long time. Quentin Tarantino's The Hateful Eight. Been out for a little while, yeah. but uh, I, uh, uh, you know, we've been gone. So, <laughs> anyhow, uh, this one, it, this if you remember, this was the controversial one where uh, Tarantino apparently the script had leaked, and he was so upset about the leak that he decided to to fold it up, that he was not going to make the film, and then changed his mind back again and started making the film. And turned out, I am in big favor of that. I I feel like I I avoided the lure of the script and i think the trailer looks terrific i mean you know really are you kidding me it's a it's just a mean-spirited western filled with bounty hunters and betrayal in the winter of wyoming how can you go wrong with that uh stars channing tatum uh samuel jackson kurt russell walton goggins jennifer jason lee remember her from her hit turn in rush (laughs) <laughs> Tim Roth, Zoe Bell, Michael Madsen, uh, and Damian Bashir, uh, Bruce Dern. Bruce Dern. Goodness. Oh, yeah. This is a, this is gonna be a uh, this is a big film. What'd you think? I am absolutely excited about this one. I am one of the people who did read the script. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which I loved. And but I, I hear that he actually changed it quite a bit. And uh, so I'm very curious to see kind of what changes he ended up making with the uh, with the final product to kind of keep a surprise for those of us who did read the script. Um, fantastic cast. I, I mean, I really did enjoy the script, and I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And something you didn't mention, but I love the fact that Ennio Morricone is actually doing the score for this, considering that Ennio kind of ripped uh, Quentin the new one 
when uh, Quentin kept using his pieces in his films because Neo is the sort of guy who's like, that music was for that film that I wrote it for. It doesn't belong in your film. Yeah. And so there was quite a little bit of a, a scuffle between the two of them. But I like to, um, I like the fact that in, they seem to have make, made up, and Neo is actually writing original music for this western, which I'm super excited about. So that's my uh, that's my uh, trailer. Very excited to see it comes out. Looks like uh, we've got a little time to wait. January eighth, two thousand sixteen. Right now, I believe it. I believe it's uh, Christmas Day in some places, though. Mm. That's what I. You know, when I think Christmas, I think Tarantino, <laughs> Kith and Kin and Quentin. <laughs> it all it all wore, it rhymes so well together, doesn't it? Uh, uh, Andy, uh, usually at this point, I'm I would do a quote from the film. Yes. It would be a charming thing if you've been listening to the show and you don't get it. Usually it's a charming sort of homage to the film. We do a quote where one of us says something to one another. And, and uh, this time it's in Swedish. And mm. as it turns out, Swedish is really freaking hard. <laughs> <laughs> and so I don't have one of those. But I will say that uh, to introduce this film, we have a brief interview uh, with uh, two fantastic gentlemen of Sweden, uh, Per Johansson and Gustav Larsed, uh, whose name may sound familiar because he totally slammed this week. Uh, uh, with the Pony Prize as well. These guys are hosts of the Film Podden podcast out of Sweden, and we were guests on their show some months back, episode 31 and a half. Uh, we talked all about movies, and it was great fun. Shoe size, what time we wake up in the morning. It was awesome. And uh, and so we invited them to join us. We do a little crossover episode, but they gave us a suggestion, listener's choice suggestion, to watch the film Force Majeure from uh, director Ruben Osland, and we have done so. Before we jump into our conversation about the film, we would like to give you our conversation with the kindly, goodly Per Johansson and Gustav Larsed. Sweden, I think, is our favorite uh, country uh, of listeners, uh, certainly the more, most active. And thanks in no small part to uh, our friends Gustav Larsed and Per Johansson from the Film Podden podcast. Gentlemen, welcome to the next reel. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we, uh, as uh, for our listeners, you you may remember, we, uh, Andy and I, were guests on the Film Podden podcast back in there. Uh, it was uh, episode 31 and a half. Yes. <laughs> we, got a, we got a half. <laughs> yeah, you got a special episode. We got a special episode, and uh, that was uh, enormously fun for us to do. And uh, in the context of that, we decided to... Uh, uh, we. Wanted to get some ideas of what you thought we should be watching. So we have, this is uh, our listener's choice episode this week. Uh, and uh, you have recommended a, uh, a wonderful film for us to talk about, which we'll get into in a minute. But before we do that, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, Film Podden. How did you guys get started? Why, uh, why did you decide to do a podcast? And, and um, tell us a little bit about, uh, about what makes your show so great. Uh, me and Per worked together. Per came to me um, at work and said he wanted to try to uh, try a podcast about uh, movies. Yes. I said, yeah, it might be fun. And then we started, uh, almost, almost instantly, we started to thinking about what it would, would be called. So I said, film... Filmpodden, which means uh, the movie podcast. It very, it's very, uh, it, it's very clean. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we so we searched, we did some Google searches and um, found out that it wasn't taken. So then we 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 said we must uh, start instantly. Yep. And then we did. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so we uh, we made a Twitter Twitter account and email account and uh, web page just to. Um, to make sure it didn't, uh, would t not to lose it. Yep. What What do you uh, when you do the show? Like when you think about how you build your episodes, uh, what movies? Uh, what is it that makes uh, a movie appropriate for you two guys to talk about? Me, it's uh, gore and the blood. <laughs> 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 no, we don't have any guidelines. Nope. Uh, there. We see everything and talk about everything. So um, no criteria to be filled. Yes, the, the, everything. And the gorier, the better. That sounds like Andy. Yeah, yeah. That's I'll right, see up, everything. right up my alley. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> when we were on the show uh, a few months back, you recommended that we see um, the film Force Majeure from director uh, Ruben Ostlund. I'll have to take the blame or 
uh, <laughs> credit, credit for that. <laughs> because um, Andy and I, at this point, we have seen it. Uh, we but we had neither of us had seen it before we uh, before we talked about it, uh, and uh, and so we have seen it. And um, uh, so curious, what what was it about this film and Ruben's work that you thought would make this um, something we should we should talk about? Yeah, well, I wanted to give you um, first uh, first up a Swedish film, something unique, and I think that Ruben Östlund is uh, without a doubt the most unique um, or one of the most unique Swedish directors and one of the most interesting ones. I think this one is a typical Swedish drama. Mm, or no, I, I don't agree on that. <laughs> <laughs> Andy, Andy, the film pudding guys are fighting. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got them to disagree right out of the game. No. Yes. I surprised Per with this choice. Is this not one you like, Per? Yeah, it's I think... not uh, quite uh, blood in... No. Uh, not blood. enough blood. For no gore. The avalanche doesn't kill anybody! <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, Per, you haven't seen any of his films before. No, I've seen uh, this yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you Wait a minute, Per, you had not seen this film when you guys recommended it to us? Nope. No, I surprised him. Oh. So funny. <laughs> okay, so as while we're here, that we're talking about it, we need you to to tell us, Per, what give us your brief review of the film. Neat, neat photo, and uh, when you watch this, you really want to go skiing. Yeah, yes. It so looked awesome. Uh, bite wise, a bit slow. Uh, halfway halfway through the film, you hardly know what what it is for a film. I got the feeling of a horror movie. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> And I got the, the sh- get the shining vibes. Yeah, maybe a little. A nice uh, desktop field in the bathroom scene. Strange to see a Game of Thrones actor out yeah. of Game of Thrones. Oh, right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and uh, Google Translate translate seeg to shui. Shui. Seeg betyder uh, slow in Swedish. Oh. And that's uh, the probably, probably my opinion for this movie. It's chewy. Shui. Okay, it's hard to swallow. Yeah, hard to swallow. Interesting, interesting. Well, what about you, Gustav? What did you think? Why did you pick this one? It's not my favorite uh, Ruben Östlund movie, but uh, it's the mo- it's the easiest to watch, I think, because his previous movies has uh, thinner storyline. Mm-hmm. At least his uh, first movie, The Guitar Mongoloid, and uh, Involuntary, that is more like scenes put together with a thin red line running through it. So this is uh, his most cinematic movie, I think. Is his body of work really focused on character then? I mean, because this definitely seemed pretty heavy on kind of the character uh, as you follow uh, Tomas as he goes through this kind of uh, struggle that he's dealing with after this avalanche. Well, all of his movies are very focused on human behavior and how people behave in uh, difficult situations. So uh, the guitar mongoloid is about people in the outskirts of society, I think, and um, involuntary is about how people uh, act in group pressure situations, and uh, play is about a gang of uh, kids who use a very complicated uh, way of robbing other kids. The atmosphere is... is, is In every movie. Yeah, 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 it's... It's, it's one of the things I love about his movies. And it's, yes, it, me too. And it's beautifully shot. And I, lo- I love the way he... Uh, I love the, the lack of uh, score. And he, he almost uses the surrounding sounds as... Uh, as a soundtrack, what what should we know about the uh, the primary actors? You know, actors that that we may not know so much about uh, in you know on this side of the uh, pond. Apart from the Game of Thrones, uh, as seeing our, our friend from Game of Thrones, who's obviously uh, quite popular. Well, uh, Forrest Majeri is actually the first movie where he uses a few actors that you actually recognize. In his previous movies, it's only first timers. Ostland definitely has an eye for for finding the right sort of talent to put on screen. I mean, I, I, I found everybody in their roles believable. And, you know, that's something that I think I always find more um, obvious in, in a foreign language film, maybe because I don't understand the language and I'm just reading what they're saying. Uh, everybody always seems more believable. I don't know. Is that something, did you find all these all these actors believable in their roles? Did they all work for you guys? Oh, yes. Yeah, I yes, think yes. so. I think so. Absolutely. Yeah. So Austin definitely uh, definitely has a, a good sense of casting and finding the right actors and working with them to bring some interesting performances out. The film is strangely to me it it comes off as a uh, let's see is it classified it's classified as a drama comedy. Yeah. <laughs> the whole time I watched it, it took me a couple of days to to get through it just was vacationing and things. But I'm watching it and every time I came back to it I thought 
I, I wonder if there is some discussion to be had around what is funny culturally, because there was much about this from the very first sort of twist that did not seem funny to me. There were a few parts where I thought that I thought were funny, but mostly it, it seemed incredibly powerfully sad. Yeah. Did, did, is it funny in Sweden? No, nope. okay. I think I, I, I have uh, I think four scenes that I think is hilarious, and the the first one is the avalanche scene. I just love love it when he he runs away screaming and wrestles a guy to the ground almost and yeah. to get away. And uh, then we have the scene after the failed dinner where uh, Christopher Hivu, the the Norwegian actor, is in bed with his girlfriend talking all night <laughs> and she just want to go to sleep uh, and uh, the after ski scene which is the one scene that stands out most th- throughout uh, all of his movies it's so out there and also the the last bus scene i thought was funny i think it's just just tragic but <laughs> 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 but it's uh, typical swedish i think yeah D- drama yeah drama. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah maybe Every Swedish movie is like this. Well, I certainly found it easier to watch than any Bergman film. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Andy, uh, any other comments on, on the film for our uh, guest uh, uh, guest before we get into the game show session section? I don't think so. I'm, I, I think it's a really interesting movie. I'm glad you guys recommended it, and I'm looking forward to chatting with Pete about it some more. Can I give it uh, my rating? Yeah. Please. Movie? Absolutely. My rating is for Ronja Rövardotters Vårskrik on the 10 grade scale. Four of the ten. Four, Four out of ten. ten. Wow. Yep. I'm sorry, Gustav. Gustav, <laughs> um, <laughs> where is it for you? Uh, eight or nine. Eight or wow. nine. Yeah. Ah, I love it. Quite a difference. A here. rift in the film pudding yeah. universe. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's uh, a little bit why we started the film pudding yeah, too. Yeah. Uh, so we are moving into the game show uh, session uh, section of our show. Uh, when we did the film pudding uh, episode, the These gentlemen offered us American films that had been translated. The titles had been translated into Swedish and then back to English. They would translate them back to English to try to stump us. And I think I fared horribly. Andy fared only (laughs) slightly better. Yeah, it was pretty tough. (laughs) (laughs) But we have uh, we have some more. I understand uh, to to try and really uh, hurt us again. Yeah, I tried to find some more, and I and I found that um, horror movies and science fiction movies from the fifties and sixties were a goldmine. Oh boy! <laughs> oh All my right. goodness! Yeah. So uh, I have a pile of them here. All right, let's do it. Um, the first is called The Spiders. The Spiders. And and I have a clue here later if you can't can't get it. Um, I'm assuming it's not really obvious, like a movie with giant spiders or something. Or is it? I can, no, uh, it's actually a movie about Earth getting invaded by giant ants. <clears throat> oh, is it them? Yep. Oh. Wow. That's a <laughs> completely different insect. That, that's not the right, not the right uh, species. Then we have The Danger from the Sky. The Danger from the Sky. Uh, it's not like uh, War of the Worlds, right? Or, or nope. The Day the Earth Stood Still. Um, nope. Invasion of the Body Snatchers. It's about a big blob. Oh, the the blob. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't know if my clues are too easy. But... Well, well, that one was. That one is a little easy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that was terrific. We did that. Have you guys have seen that one? Please tell me you've seen that one. Yeah, I have seen that one. Uh, I, yet. I don't know if I've seen the original. I've seen the was it the nineties remake? Yeah, or yeah. no, you got to see yeah. the original. That's the okay. That's, that's the, the Steve best. McQueen one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what about space attacks? Space oh, they're attacks. So, they're so this is another vague. one from the sixties. Space uh, attacks. I think so. This one seems like War of the Worlds. Invasion or invasion? Uh, was that invasion? In, invaders from Mars. No, it was close. Oh, is that I think it? you mentioned it before. Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Yes. <laughs> Space attacks. Uh, so, what about the ragdoll? The ragdoll. That doesn't sound like a space one. No, it's uh, that's more of a horror movie. The ragdoll. Uh, um, it, it makes me think of Chucky, but it seems that's a little, not quite a little 50s. late. Gosh, I don't know. I, 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 I totally should I do an, e- an easy clue? 
Yeah, give us well, a clue on that one. Okay. It's about a hunter of the night. A hunter of the night? Or the other way around. <laughs> night of the I'm hunter? S- <laughs> yes. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> It took me a minute really? to, to process that your uh, clue there. Uh, yeah. That's how pretty... does it? How do you get the ragdoll out of Night of the Hunter? <laughs> I don't know. So, well, because they hide the money in the doll. Oh, uh, that of was, course. Okay, that yeah, sure. that, yeah, that's a strange thing to latch onto for the title. I wonder if uh, Charles Lawton approved that. <laughs> you want one or one or two more? Do it. Yeah, let's do it. Two more. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, in the claws of fear. In the claws of fear. Now, see, I'm, I hear that and I think, okay, there's probably a literal claw in the yeah, film. Yeah, probably. In the claws of see, fear. I haven't seen this one, actually, but... Hmm. It makes me think of, like, giant crabs or something. Some ocean movie. Think of the opposite of giant. Mm. Yeah, something... Bugs, ants. Um, we've already done an ant film. Um, this could be This could be the, um, the sub... The um, the tagline of Ant Man. <laughs> the claws of fear. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Ant Man. The claws of fear. Ant Man. <laughs> That's the <laughs> so sequel. Funny. That's number two. Um, I uh, goodness. The Incredible Shrinking Man. The incredible oh, Shrinking Man wow. in the claws of fear. Because like the, the <laughs> oh, cat. Goodness. Okay. Wow. That's a. That's a tricky one. Man. Yeah. Uh, so one last now, right? Yeah. <clears throat> um, this is called The Crawling Hand. Oh. And this is oh. a science fiction movie. Oh. Uh, Third, oh, what is that man. one? The... And it's not The Addams Family. <laughs> no, but that's no. something that rings the... There was a, there was a movie there from was the a film, 60s. The Crawling Hand, yeah. right? That was... That's what uh, I'm thinking of. That's not what you have, though, right? I don't know. I haven't seen this one either. <laughs> if it was actually <laughs> translated correctly, that would be a good one to end on. <laughs> right. Yeah. Because it's from the movie, The Crawling it Hand. It is from the movie, The Crawling Hand. Um, I, I, don't I don't know. know. What, what else do you have? Invasion of the Saucermen. Wow. Oh, okay. no. I didn't have that at all. That's, yeah. <laughs> they should have just used that for the movie, The Crawling Hand. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Gentlemen, this is awesome. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, all the way from Sweden. We so appreciate you guys. Yeah, so so nice chatting with you guys again. Hopefully uh, we'll get a chance to do some more back and forth on each other's shows down the line again. The great crossover episodes. Oh, of course. That would be awesome. Where would you like us to point people to uh, find out more about you and your show? www.filmpodden, <laughs> F-I-L-M-P-O-D-D-E-N. Dot S-E. All right. So for those who speak Swedish, that's where you need to go. Yeah. 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 Or you could uh, contact us on Twitter at FilmPodden. Excellent. And Excellent. use uh, Google Translate. And use yeah. Google Translate. <laughs> it, works, it actually works remarkably well, this Google yep. Translate. So thanks, guys. We will uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks a lot. Yes, Thank you very absolutely. Much. Thank you. Andy, uh, I, I, as I said in our conversation with these two kind gentlemen, I had a hard time laughing at this movie, and I think it may be because I, uh, I harbor some sort of uh, masculine shame. <laughs> <laughs> I, I ended up on the really liking it side of things. Yeah. I enjoyed it quite a bit. It, I, I really had no idea where it was going to go. I didn't know anything about the film going into it. I had seen the poster, I think, is all I had seen. I had never seen the trailer. And I just loved this this torturous journey that it took me on of watching this family um, really kind of uh, breaking down because of this event that happened. And it just, it really kind of overtook me. And uh, I mean, I had a a really great time watching it. I did. Uh, I did too. I, I had a great time watching it. I'm still not sure, and I hope you are going to help me understand some of it because I feel like there are there are pieces, particularly at the end, that uh, that just slay me. I don't know what to think. Uh, but I love the way this film looks more than many that I have seen recently. I really adore 
the camera in this film, the location, the sets, the the way these the the sparse cast interacts with the universe that uh, in in which they are living. I had a delightful time just getting lost in it. I thought it was gorgeous. I it, it's very difficult for me to think of a better snow movie, uh, just in terms of the straight up camera work. I know you're thinking, well, cliffhanger. Uh, (laughs) but Andy, I would, I would even suggest this is better visually, certainly than cliffhanger. Wow. That should have been on the poster. (laughs) (laughs) Looks better than cliffhanger. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I can't, the only thing better on this film would have been actually to put like the, uh, you know, Stallone hanging off the thing, trying to save a raccoon. Or they could have put, it's just like K2-2. <laughs> uh, let's walk through uh, just a little bit about what the film is about. Well, it's about a, I mean, I would guess it's a fairly well-to-do family on a, uh, a ski holiday, a Swedish family down in the French Alps, where they are uh, enjoying a week up of skiing in just the, one of the most beautiful ski resorts I've seen. And uh, on day two, while they're having lunch, there is an avalanche. Now, this is uh, it's already well established in this film that they this mountain they do these controlled avalanche um, uh, or controlled avalanches uh, periodically in order to keep them from actually happening and killing people. And there is this controlled avalanche that happens while they're having lunch. It starts looking like it's going out of control, and people start freaking out. The dad of this family of four freaks out and runs. He grabs his phone and his gloves and he runs from the table while the mom tries to grab the kids. He completely dismisses all of them and disappears. Um, The avalanche doesn't actually do anything. It's harmless, but it creates this white smoke and i guess this it's called what is it's like avalanche smoke or snow smoke i think yeah when when an avalanche hits like that it just this big burst of white and uh, um and in this really stunningly shot scene um the dad comes back and everybody is shaken and then we really just kind of watch over the next several days as this husband and wife their uh, relationship suffers because of what happened and because when the mom finally does say she couldn't believe that the father abandoned them and he basically starts with this attitude acting like he didn't see it that way and that's not what happened he saw he it was a totally different experience for him and completely denying the events and it makes for a really interesting character study as we watch these two deal with them uh, each other handle uh, how they are uh, with when they're together with friends um, or whether they're or, or see how it's affecting their friends and um, all the way through to the end of the film. I mean, it really is just kind of affecting them all the way through. And uh, I mean, I guess, I guess that's the long and the short of the film. I, it, yeah, I, for me, it, it ends up being such an amazing story of this father's shame. I wonder, did you buy his take on it? Did you buy it that he was, uh, that that Tomas was uh, really didn't didn't remember it the same way. I completely bought that he was ashamed that he did that, and it was trying to come up with something to say, and so he created this lie that, that on the on on a you know a spur of the moment sort of thing that he had to say because his wife brought this up while they're at dinner with friends. Um, he said, oh, I didn't, that's not what happened. And then he had to live with that lie that he had created. And I I think that that made it even worse for him, that he had to continually go along with this lie that he created, uh, knowing that uh, that's not what happened, but he was too ashamed to admit it. Okay. Yeah, I think I'm, I think I agree uh that and i i was just having trouble kind of going back and forth between you know is he making that up intentionally to hide himself or is he is it one of those sort of manifested truths that just happened uh as a result of his shame but that for me is really what this film is about it's about shame as a father of of you know failing in some way to live up to your own expectation of of uh you know heroism and that is a it, it makes it a really challenging thing to watch you know for me because it it really hits close to home i mean did you find it sort of as a father yourself did you find yourself sort of thinking about god what what would i have done 
Oh, uh, yeah. I think everybody probably is going to ask that, much like their friends do. It's like, Which well, was perfect. Yeah, I don't know how I would react if you did that to me. You know, I wonder what, wonder what I would say. I, I mean, that was great, having that um, outsider's view reacting within the film as looking at uh, exactly that situation. Yeah, I mean, I was like, gosh, would I, like, what would I have done? It's one of those things. And I think uh, their friend, the older, the older woman, um, says it best when it's just like, you know, when, when something like that is, is happening, um, rarely do people act heroic. It's people just by nature, just kind of, they click and it's just like that, almost that survival instinct takes over and you don't necessarily know what you're going to do until you're in that situation. What I love about how the film handles this issue is that it creates a, a space of just schizophrenia for the wife Ebba mm, yeah. because everywhere they go and there's a portion in the middle of the film where the entire story is essentially being told um, in the context of their relationship with other couples right there's a string of like three of these sort of um, dates that they go on these couple dates and this thing keeps coming up between them and then we so they in terms of the momentum of the film they have this conversation super awkward then they have to go find a way to normalize after it and they it becomes increasingly difficult to normalize their relationship after it and they do these more sort of bananas things to each other um and and so that experience each of these couples the couples at least one party makes a big deal about how maybe he did the right thing. Maybe what he did was okay. Maybe what he did, even if he can't remember it, we're just trying to help him rationalize and come to see truth by telling him it's okay. Mm -hmm. And the whole time, his wife is in tears because it's not okay. She's falling out of the relationship, and he doesn't even see it. He's put himself in this, this sort of blind space where he doesn't even see it. You know, one section, I think this was our, our friend from Game of Thrones. Uh, Christopher Hivju. Yes, we like him so much. I think he says, uh, you know, it's just like when cabin pressure drops on an airplane and you, you put your mask on before you put the mask on your kids. So so you did the right thing in this situation. <laughs> you know, so maybe, maybe you did the right thing to escape so that you would live to go back and dig them out of this giant hole, the, or out of the avalanche. And that creates such an incredible dramatic tension for me between the husband and wife. And it creates such a space of, uh, uh, you know, as we watch them kind of demolish each other silently uh, by just watching them not be able to come to terms with each other's response to this thing. I thought it was m just magical script writing. I did too. I, the, the, the way the screenplay was structured where you were there for these five days and, and every day there's opportunities to watch as the relationship kind of crumbles and there's more and more cracks built into it. And, and you're right, having these other couples reflecting and and being um, observers on this situation really helps and i think the way it builds um, the story to the climactic moments uh, when you have um, you've got the big moment at the end where he kind of has his breakdown and there's all the screaming that goes on and there's the the incredible um, <laughs> most uh, crazy crying breakdown that i've ever seen um, which <laughs> this is the illustrious uh, after ski scene, yes, yes, the the giant uh, breakdown of hate and self loathing that uh, Tomas <laughs> has, um, the the blubberiest. Uh, We've all been there, am I right? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's it's a stunning scene, and then I think from there it goes on to the the final day that ends up wrapping everything up in such a way that, um, I, I don't know, for me, it was like the perfect way to wrap everything up, whether it's, uh, I think it's both the fog scene, which really uh, was probably for me the most terrifying part of the film. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was of, awful. And he leaves his kids. I know. That was two kids oh. sitting in the fog. I'm like, I am going to scream. <laughs> If the father and mother never come back here, it was it would I would have lost it. <laughs> we should recut it and just do a credits roll yeah, right was... over the over the white. <laughs> the parents never come back. Sorry, kids. Oh, my this God. is a lesson in, in ski safety. 
Did you catch that, kids? Never leave your parents. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, let's go ski. Sure, the whole top of the mountain's in fog. But... First, we have to watch Force Majeure. Oh, man. Yeah. So, okay. So, that was very intense. Yeah, that was very intense. And then, I think uh, the uh, um, Ruben Ostlin, the director, comes up with a really interesting end- ending, uh, and he also wrote it, um, where they're finally leaving the mountain and they're on a bus going down, I mean, one of the most ridiculously insane roads I've ever seen. <laughs> that, yes. I mean, I, I, you know, I, <laughs> people should not be driving buses on roads that look like the one at the end of this film. It's an insane road. Just and, a hairpin after hairpin, and the bus is way, way too long. So yeah, it, it has to keep making these like 90-point turns to get around each corner. And that means that people are hanging, like literally hanging off of the edge as the bus is kind of trying to make its way around. Very right. scary. And this is the point where the mom is the one who ends up freaking out and has to leave the bus, abandoning her husband and children because she can't be on this bus that is so dangerous. Everyone freaks out. And then uh, Matt's, Christopher's uh, character, he ends up being the one who kind of helps everybody stay orderly and everything. And I loved how they hit all the points in the film about what would you do and all that. And you get to see it all kind of play out again with different people now at the end of the film. And Mm. it was such a strong ending to this already strong film. I just really felt that he found the right way to tell the story, saying you never know what it is that's going to trigger something like that in a person. It's just one of those survival instincts. And it could be... It could be anything, but it could be one little moment that all of a sudden the the only thing you're thinking about is, holy crap, I got to get out of here right now. Yeah. And I, I think I think that was the, the strongest way he could have gotten that across here. I found myself really manic by the end of the film. <laughs> uh, I was I was really frustrated, uh, in, and I think in a good way in in hindsight. But I was not feeling good by the time we got to the end because the film spends you know the the bulk of its uh, you know what? How how long is it? It's it's fair. It's straight up two hours, really. So it spends the bulk yeah. of its two hours building this level of thriller intensity, right? The music, the length of shots, the way many of the conversations of the shots. So the camera is focused on people who are not speaking, so you become accustomed to listening. I think really carefully, um, and, and I think it's a it's a brilliant brilliant visual sort of auditory trope in this film that the the way he uses sound and then they go outside and the soundscape is made up of these creaking old metallic chairlifts and motors and just awful sounds that bring this entire universe an amazing conflict with the gorgeousness of the landscape and the facility that they're in it, it is it is just maddening that you you want by at some point you want somebody to be swallowed in an avalanche just for that <laughs> sense of relief that my god they built this thing and so when they have the fog scene at the end with the family and he leaves the kids he goes to get some, he carries her back to the to the the uh, where the kids were they find each other and they're all sitting in a pile and she is he's carrying her as if she's like broken her leg or something right mm-hmm. and then she stands up and walks away. <laughs> what? 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 Uh, that's the one that gives me uh, that give me gave me so much pain that she got up and walked away because it felt like was she testing him? Was it planned? Was it a thing? What, or was was it something that the two of them worked out together in order to remind the kids what a strong relationship they have because the kids thought that they were going to get a divorce, which I thought was another brilliant little twist that they kept coming back to the kids and their sense of frailty of the relationship of their parents. I thought that was great. Mm -hmm. What's your take on that? Because it drove me batty. It was a really interesting uh, decision because in all uh, normal uh, normalcy, you would have expected the father and the mother to just be skiing side by side back to the kids. Right. Mm -hmm. And the fact that he was carrying her was very strange. And the only thing that that uh, I could kind of make from it was that it was a uh, it was almost like the father needed an opportunity to to now 
show his wife that, look, I can save you. I am not going to be the guy who's going to be the guy who runs when the avalanche happens. I There are times where I will be brave and I will go back and I will save you. And And I think that's, in my mind, like he opted to carry her and she opted to let him because he needed to have that moment where he could kind of feel like he did the saving. Okay, so but do you think it was premeditated? Or do you I think, think that was... you don't think they talked about it? No, I don't think they talked about it. I think that he went back and kind of picked her up. And it, it was almost one of those subconscious things where he kind of subconsciously needed to do that. And she could tell. And so she kind of subconsciously let him do it. Okay. All right. That was my interpretation of it. I, it, it really uh, bothered me. And it, I was ju- that was the thing that just threw me almost out of the film and yet i thought the 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 cli- the end of the film this as they're going down the mountain was a a wonderful release yeah mostly because it ends up celebrating something i think that was that was subtly even not so subtly tested throughout the the uh, rest of the film which is a celebration of partnership and in fact uh, when we see her freak out and realize that, oh, my God, it, it really can happen to anybody. Thank goodness they have each other mm-hmm. because they are able to lean on each other when when one person is weak. And and if that isn't a celebration of just the partnership, the many hands sort of mentality of a relationship, uh, then I don't know what is. I, I thought he just uh, to me that and maybe I'm alone in reading into it. But at the end, as he sort of comes to his own and they're walking up this walking down the side of this mountain and and uh, his, his kid says, you know, I didn't know you smoked. He says, I do. As he kind of takes ownership of a lot of the things that, you know, of one of what we are to assume are many things that he's kept hidden um, as a result of of kind of not being himself in the relationship. Um, I, I do think at least to me, we get to see this this empowerment thanks to the relationship. Yeah, his wife was able to be there for the kids during the avalanche, but he was able to be there for the kids during the crazy bus ride. Uh, I thought that was really great. Yeah, I agree. It was a, a strong ending to the film in a way that gave that final uh, touch to the uh, to the character development that we've seen over the course of the film. We saw him rescue her earlier, but now here's that opportunity to kind of give it that last little test, basically. Yeah, and it's it not works even because, very nicely. Right, because it's not even just for her. It's to show him as a resonant force in the family, mm-hmm. right? And and I think that was that sort of that next, uh, that level up. Uh, that, yeah, he can, he can go carry her down a mountain, but he can also be there for the kids just like she was when she's right. in a state of complete panic. Yep. I thought it was. I thought that was great. In in terms of actors in the film, how many of them did you know? Um, I knew uh, Christopher Heavju, which we've already talked about from Game of Thrones, mm-hmm. um, who is just. I mean, he's just got the best look, oh. you know. <laughs> well, and he has the best scene in this film. Which one is that? It's their their over oh, his he has been. Uh, he's been dating a younger woman. He's divorced. <laughs> he's divorced. <laughs> And his wife has the kids, and so he's dating a younger woman who asks him, who, who says to him at, at night, you know, I, I think you would have run uh, right. when talking about the right. And he can't let it go, and so they spend the night in bed together talking about this and him defending himself and her trying to stop talking about it and go to sleep, and it's <laughs> fantastic. I To me, that is a, a real highlight of the film. If, if you're going to call this film a comedy, it's because of that scene. That's that's a very good one, yes. Um, so I recognize him, and Brady Corbett is the American actor, the young American that the older Swedish lady is dating. Um, recognize him, um, as we talked about, 13 Funny Games, Martha Marcy, Mae Marlene, Melancholia, um, from right here in Scottsdale, Arizona, it turns out. I found myself really enamored by the performance of uh, Johannes Kunke as Thomas. Mm, um, absolutely. I thought he was great. Uh, and really, really want to see him in more things that I can understand, but I can read too, so that's good. Yes. Uh, yeah, I think he was delightful. He was brilliant. Um, I, I really think that Ostland really found a brilliant cast. I mean, I think the four people of the family, Johannes Kunke, Lisa Lovin Kongsley, uh, Vincent and Clara Vettergren, I don't know if I'm pronouncing all those names right, but 
it was a, a perfect chemistry for the family. I thought they all did a great job. They all did a great job in the family scenes, whether it's getting photographed on top of the mountain or uh, having lunch together or just going up the lifts together or uh, all getting ready in the bathroom together, which, I mean, it's such an interesting um, ant farm sort of look that we have of this family as they're constantly getting ready and just doing these sorts of things. Yeah. And, it, you know, it's it's a funny look at intimacy for the family. They're all in a very small space uh, and, you know, they're all just sort of walking around with their, you know, mechanical or electric toothbrushes. Mm-hmm. And, and, they're, uh, and they're matching uh, and the, yeah, long johns. They're matching long johns. I thought that was just a really beautiful sort of you know, quaint look at, at what ultimately is a pretty realistic family. I thought that was great. You know, I did think in the nature, I and mean, we, we touched on the camera work a little bit, and for some reason just talking about the family made me um, feel like I needed to say this right here. But the, the something about the way that the cinematography of this uh, is, um, it's put on film in a way that it's it's almost distant you're almost looking like uh, an observer at everything you're kind of step a step back from these people just kind of observing this family observing them almost through like a a a, a, a mirror looking at them as they go about their daily lives as if we're studying them and the whole film, there's so little camera movement. The the camera placement is so um, uh, planned as you're, um, you know, moving up the mountain, following somebody as they go up the lifts, or standing with them as you go down a long uh, conveyor belt sort of contraption, or skiing, or eating, or getting ready. It's all done with such um, uh, machine-like planning that. Uh, it, it becomes very mesmerizing just watching this family. But even with all of that, I do find uh, there to be an element of uh, kind of that emotional connection that I still get with this family, which I really like that with the camera work as kind of separated as it is or separating us. Um, I like that we are still able to end up connecting with these people. I, I agree with you. It's an interesting, you have an interesting um, sort of commentary on that. And I found this this quote from Osland in an interview uh, with Filmmaker Magazine. And he he's describing uh, about just, you know, does he do reshoots? When he's answering the question, do you do reshoots of entire sequences? And he says, I reshoot sometimes, but mostly I do it like this. I don't want to put all of my time when it comes to movie making to moving the camera around. Most productions are like, oh, we have to move the camera. We have to go to another angle. And you don't even have you, you don't even have time to concentrate on the image of what's happening in front of the camera. What I do is I have one camera position each day, maybe two, just focusing on what's in front of the camera, working with the image. The set designer can work with it. The lighting designer can work with it. The actor can take risks in the beginning. They can try things out they wouldn't have done if they had a short shooting time on that scene. Then we rehearse and we do it over and over again. I have an average of around 40 takes on each scene. Uh, hmm. Uh, I think that's a that's a really interesting thing, and the fact that you notice that I, I think is uh, kind of important to note. That uh, I agree with you. It feels like just much more of a you know, uh, I don't maybe not so stereotypical, but a moving image. It feels like a, a portrait that you're watching kind of be painted in real time as a result of the staticness of of the camera. It also is a very interesting way of making a film that deals so much with nature. You know, you're, we're looking at this essentially um, man invading nature to create this entertainment, right? And you get really interesting looks at how the ski resort works. You get the, the kind of the machinery at work. You get the snow plows. You get the snow machines blowing snow. You get the blast pipes, whatever they are, that, that create these avalanches. The lifts, there's so many different machines at, at work all the time, the resorts themselves, everything keeping this kind of man-made world alive as man invades nature. But then you also get this really interesting glimpse into the nature of man. So it's a really interesting cinematographic style to actually tie all of that together in a very unique way. And I love the way he approaches it of allowing the image to live within the frame that he creates. I they they shot this thing, most of this thing at the Copper Hill Mountain Lodge uh, in Sweden, and 
you should just go to copperhill.se and look at it and soak it in because it is seriously one of the coolest facilities I've ever seen. Are you sure that's where they filmed it? Well, because I see here that it, they filmed it at the Les Les Arcs ski resort in Savoie, France. Well, I think that's ex- at the externals exteriors. That's that's all the exteriors. Because the mountain lodge is the is the inside, like the architecture, the cool, oh, the interior, like, gotcha. cool buildings and things like that. That it's that's that, yeah, it's it looks gorgeous. Well, we'll have to put the links for both the the ski resort and the ski lodge because that's one of the uh, things that I like uh, so much. It, you know, when you look at at how they move the camera around the inside of this building, I thought that's got to be a fake. Like, how would how would they be like? How would that? Cl- There's this great character of the like maintenance guy, the cleaning guy, right? <laughs> who <laughs> pops up in the most wonderful places, and and just the way they use the facility. Uh, it, you know, they have him standing on one side of this giant cavernous thing, kind of looking down a few levels of the uh, across the interior of uh, to another balcony, and they they're asking him, "Could you give us some privacy, please? Go away." <laughs> he won't right. really do it. He's not good at that. Um, or or you know, the wonderful scene where the kids he goes in to vacuum their room, and mom and dad are, want to talk outside, so she shoves the kids in, and they keep saying, "There's a man in here. There's a man in here," and she shoves him <laughs> and shuts the door. <laughs> uh, which is awful but uh, I just love the way they move around the facility I think it's really really cool and uh, well the the lodge is very cool the mountain road which is filmed in Italy is very cool I mean it's it, wonderful locations they found a lot of fascinating locations to tie everything together in a way that works very well to actually convey the message of the uh, of the film and I think the avalanche itself was filmed in Canada so all over the place. Mm-hmm. I I remember what I was saying. You, I love the way you put that. That this is essentially man invading nature, and I think that's one of the things that you really see with these lodges in general in these locations. Really, uh, it's we do we do horrible things to mountains. Well, that's and I line. think it's I think it's highlighted the best when it's the scene of I, I don't want to call it debauchery, but it's basically all of the drunk guys going and and you know partying in the spa. That basically was crazy and and it's like kind of all the screaming and everything going on there that's like you know <laughs> man at his most vulgar yeah. in nature right and it's like that's the moment that he's finally able to kind of release a little bit i think yeah. and, and kind of that helps him get over the hump so that he has gets to have his big breakdown with his wife uh ruben osland uh, was started out as a really a he was a skier First, shooting ski movies. He's he's a contemporary of ours, and and the way he talks about it, he grew up. You know, his first uh, films were you know VHS and mini DV, and uh, he says he shot a little bit of sixteen millimeter when he was shooting ski movies, but mostly he's a he's a tape guy, uh, and and that that warms my heart a little bit. Yeah, I love those little VHS film mm. projects. <laughs> Uh, and, and eventually he says the, the movie making became more interesting than the skiing. And boy, you can really tell. It makes me want to catch the rest of his films if they have this kind of kind of celebration of snow. Uh, mostly because I hate skiing myself. I hate it. But I do I love, love watching skiing. about it. I love skiing. And this made me want to go go up to the French Alps and ski for a week. <laughs> I mean, I that would be a dream, going to this Les Arcs uh, ski resort and just hanging out and watching the avalanches. <laughs> <laughs> That's horrible. That'd be a horrible time. Oh, yes. Right. A little bit. Uh, you mentioned a little bit of the cinematography of this thing. Uh, cinematography is done by uh, Friedrich Wenzel. Uh, I have seen nothing else that he's done. No. Mm-hmm. Are you disagreeing with I, me? Uh, nope. I yes, you have. Said, I was saying, no, <laughs> I have not either. I've seen none of them. Um, uh, it's not a huge list. He's not. He's uh, you know like like Ruben. Um, they're relatively well, I, I, relatively youngish. I mean, they're in their um, late thirties, early forties. And uh, Frederick Frederick has uh, ten films or ten, ten projects to his name, a couple shorts. Yeah. Um, I, I, again, I haven't seen anything else by Ostland. 
um, from our conversation, it sounds like the style is, I mean, it sounds like the sparse style is a little bit kind of something that he goes for. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think paired here with Frederick, I think they really make just a stunning film to look at. Yeah, totally agree. Uh, anybody else you want to uh, highlight, uh, from the cast or crew? Um, no, I think that's pretty much it. I, I mean, I just really, I think that it was a very strong uh, cast in front of the camera and the crew. This is the sort of film that would be a blast to work on going up to a ski resort and staying there for, you know, however many weeks it is to film mm-hmm. and just, uh, you know, stay in the resort, go skiing to film and just hang out. I, I think it would be a, a lot of fun to do. Just say, just say the word. I'll be, I'll manage the lodge. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> uh, did you happen to uh, find anything on how it did? I didn't. I, I found some on how it did. I couldn't find anything as far as how much it cost to make. Unfortunately, um, this film film did come out. Uh, it, it had its initial release in August 2014 in Sweden, and then kind of expanded around the world from there. I think it hit the U.S. in December 2014. Um, it made here in the U.S. about $1.4 million, and internationally only about, from what I could find, $187,000. Um, I don't know if that's just uh, Sweden. I don't know if that's the entire world. I, I don't know, but that's all I could find figure-wise. So it was a total gross of about $1.5 million dollars um that it ended up grossing um so it didn't it didn't gross a ton i don't know what it cost but i am very curious it's it's definitely a small production yeah but in a crazy place right yeah very um, an amazing i mean this is a, a the sort of film that you find the right location and it gives you tons of production value but just in terms of getting people there as a producer i mean come on like, oh, yeah. logistically, that must be a disaster. Especially if it's mostly Swedish people. I mean, it's all in France, so I, I can imagine that it's uh, tricky. Hmm. Well, awesome. I The guys were, it seems, uh, pretty split on this, uh, Per and Gustav. Uh, I, can see, I can see how that split would occur. Uh, for me, I, I think you and I are in more agreement on this one. I think this is right. I mean, I think this was a delightful film to watch. It was visually stunning, and um, the the story for me just really, really held up. It's a patient film, and and um, I I enjoyed just getting absorbed in it. Yeah, it's not a film to watch with somebody that you're just starting a relationship with. <laughs> It may spur some conversations that you, uh, I don't know, maybe you should have these conversations at the beginning of a relationship. <laughs> That's pretty funny. You know, we did, we did mention a little bit the, uh, um, the, the religious thing. Yeah. On my notes. Right. Did that yeah. stick out to you? It was a strange little uh, moment, but I think it was an interesting, I, I, my interpretation of that moment where the conversation about religion comes up as far as she's saying, oh, you're not religious. He says, no, that's not what I said. I said that I was an, I was an atheist, but you know, it was, it struck me as a parallel look at people misunderstanding things or seeing things in different ways. Yeah. And, and that's, I, I don't think that it was trying to jump into a conversation about religion at all, um, but I did find it to be a very uh, uh, pointed look at how he says one thing, she interprets it another way, and now they have these two different viewpoints on things. Oh, I although, really like that. Although, interestingly, and I, I went back like five times and rewatched the avalanche scene because it's just such a stunning piece of film to watch. The very first image that you see after the whiteout is you see kind of a, a vague shadow of a figure come up and say, it's okay, you can, st- you can get up now. It's just, you know, nothing happened. It's a figure that looks like an angel. And I was like, what is, what is that an angel figure? Because it looks like a person walking with great big angel wings. And it just struck me. And I couldn't get it out of my head that I'm like, there's a figure that looks like an angel walking through telling the wife, uh, Ebba that everything is okay and she can get up. There's nothing to be afraid of. 
and then it kind of disappears into the whiteness and then the white disappears and you see everything and it took me a while to pinpoint who this character is because I'm like, does that character actually appear in here? There is a character in the back who is carrying, it's a, it's a guy who's carrying like two big red bags, one over each shoulder. And that's and he's clearly the person who is the person who kind of looks like that angelic figure. But it has to be planned that that is the image that we see first. In my mind, especially having heard what Ostlin says about... Um, how meticulously he plans his framing and he spends so much time on the frame itself. Yeah. The fact that the very first thing we see is a figure that does look like the the silhouette of an angel telling her that everything's okay. I do think that there is a very interesting little glimpse into religion right there. Oh, that's fascinating. That's a great catch. I have to go back and watch that sequence. Yeah. Uh, I, I thought that was great. What the heck was it with that drone? <laughs> <laughs> the very first scene with the drone, I'm like, is there, is there an alien in the film all of a sudden? What is going on? <laughs> That's true, but I think it was only in there so we get the payoff when he gets hit in the face. Yes, I agree. which was brilliant. The drone. So the drone. Uh, talk about the scene. Yeah, well, we it's the the first scene. We're just looking at the hotel at night, and it's a night sky, and then all of a sudden it looks like a UFO is flying around in the night sky. <laughs> Turns out it's the little boy's drone. And then in the middle of the intense conversation between um, Tomas and Ebba and, and their two friends, Mats and his girlfriend, out of the blue, in <laughs> kind of an intense moment, you're at like a drone POV <laughs> as it's flying right at Mats. And it's just... It was, it's so good. It's insane. Insane. Uh, it's so good. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now we should rank it. Let's do it. All right. Head over to flickchart.com, everybody, slash the next reel, and uh, you can join us in our ranking. Now, I think we've we've cleared out the guilty pleasure cruft, and we're ready to get back into some serious ranking, and, and I'm, I, I'm optimistic for this film. I think it's going to do all right. Okay. Force Majeure, a.k.a. Tourist, or Kind Hearts and Coronets? I would say Force Majeure. I would, too. Force Majeure or Sleepless in Seattle? Hmm. Hmm. That's a lot tougher for me. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, the challenge of is is that this is a. I mean, that's an easy film to digest. It, it is uh, a very easy film. It's easy. Watch. That's that is the big challenge. I, if right? you're a simple person, I think you'd probably go for. <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean. Like the simpler of the people, uh, the, what you would, would probably choose uh, Sleepless in Seattle. Those who don't appreciate a good cinematic challenge. A proper a, a proper critic would probably say, you know, force majeure. Well, hell, I'm not a proper <laughs> critic. Simple minded Andy is going to say sleepless in Seattle. It is. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, uh, that was good. All right, force majeure or the town? I'm going to go force majeure on this one. Hmm. Uh, the town is a really fun film to watch. I quite like the town. I may have to go to the town. How much? I kind of waffling a little bit. So I'll I'll give you force majeure. All right. I know waffle. Okay, force majeure or about a boy. Hmm. I uh hmm. I will say about a boy. All right. I'll give you about a boy on that. I did enjoy about a boy a lot. Performance of the boy was terrific. I uh, yeah. Force majeure or marathon man? I spent a lot of time at the dentist this week, so <laughs> I'm going to say force majeure. I'm saying force majeure on this one, yeah. Force majeure or drive? Ooh. Oh! That's a great film. I'm going to do drive. I am too. Uh, force majeure or the prestige? That's another tough one, I think, for me. Yeah, I, do, I really enjoy the prestige. I think I'm gonna have to go prestige. Yeah, I, I think I enjoy the prestige more. I think Force Majeure is a better film. Yeah. Um, hmm. I'll go prestige with you though, for enjoyment factor. Force Majeure or The Abyss? I'm definitely The Abyss on this one. As am I. All right, and there we are, number sixty-seven out of one ninety-seven. I think that's a 
great place for this one to land. That feels pretty good. I, I, you know, as I'm looking around at other reviews, they seem to be like our friends in Sweden. I, I, they are kind of binary. You either love it or you don't. I'm very interested in the blot spot this week. I'm curious how uh, how old Ben's going to come out with this yeah. one. Absolutely. All right. This is good. Where do we go now? We're getting back into uh, getting back into the the flow of things, aren't we? We are. Yeah, we're finishing up with the listener's choice, uh, done with the guilty pleasure break that we had, and we're getting into a a fun series I'm looking forward to. It is going to be a Meryl Streep series, but not just Meryl Streep. We're actually going to be jumping into films that Meryl Streep was nominated for. Uh, and or <laughs> I could talk. Oh, easy for you to say. Yeah. We're jumping into a series of films that Meryl Streep has been uh, received an Oscar nomination for. So they're, they're really right there. The the, the, you might as well just say it. The Meryl Streep comedies. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> yes, indeed. She devil. Oh, <laughs> uh, uh, that's good. Starting off with that one. <laughs> No, this is actually looking at uh, at the film, starting with The Deer Hunter, her first Oscar-nominated film, and then Kramer vs. Kramer, The French Lieutenant's <laughs> Woman, and ending with Sophie's Choice. Oh, man, that was a riot. <laughs> <laughs> she actually, you know, the choice. Woo! <laughs> uh, uh, yes. I'm waiting for uh, Mel Brooks. <laughs> Uh, Broadway <laughs> comedy version of that one. Oh, do we ever need that? The universe needs that. <laughs> the boy or the girl, which one do I pick? <laughs> oh, oh, my goodness. Well, hey, uh, it's been a treat. Glad to be back in the saddle. Absolutely. Since summer's over. Woo. Almost. Mm-hmm. All right. I got to go to bed. All right. I'm going to go practice my avalanche swimming. <laughs> swimming. Because that's what you do if you that, <laughs> get stuck in an avalanche. That's, <laughs> that's how you survive. Ridiculous <laughs> thing I've ever heard. Amazon uh, comes in with some people who uh, disagree with us. I uh, yes, uh, putting it. Mine, uh, my review comes from uh, George Raddick uh, on May thirteenth, two thousand fifteen. He said he calls uh, Force Majeure Majeure Merd. Well, <laughs> here's two hours of my life I'll never get back. This should be an instructional video to show film students how to repulse an audience after presenting an intriguing premise. Tomas's blatant act of cowardice shocks us at the 30-minute mark, but the rest of the story about how his wife, Ebba, his children, his friends deal with it moves so glacially that you end up shouting at the screen, get on with it. Uh, useless scenes that litter the landscape, including a totally unnecessary nude scene that only serves to embarrass the lead actress who should not take her shirt off in a film, no matter what the director says. The last scene oh, illustrates geez. how far I would walk not to see another movie from this writer. Glad I only spent 99 cents on this. I think that is a, I, you know, I, uh, that is a terrible review. It is. It really is. It is terrible and it's mean-spirited and i you know find problems with it have have fun with your language that's fine but this this was just that's really a, a incredibly rude thing to say about a, a really talented actress married on you george that's not cool not cool yes well mine uh doesn't make fun of any of the performances in the film actually well, I shouldn't say that. Uh, she she reacts to the uh, the way that people react in the film. This is by Rebecca L. Taggett, a.k.a. Becky Taggett, who says, one star, trivial. It was kind of boring. My ex-husband did things like that all the time. That woman making a big deal out of it was a bit pathetic. Rich people's problems. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 
ex-husband did that all the time. He would abandon us at truck stops during armed conflicts. Like, you know, whatever. He's, it just, you know, left us in a burning house. I mean, we were fine. It is hard to believe we have been having in-depth conversations about movies since 2011. You are telling me. Producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Just visit thenextreel.com slash originals. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great discussions. Season 5 had some great adaptations, like our Meryl Streep Oscar-nominated performances series. We covered adaptations like Kramer vs. Kramer, Sophie's Choice, and The French Lieutenant's Woman. It's a real Sophie's Choice between those books. <laughs> you see what I, <laughs> see what I did there? Uh, yeah. Uh, and I don't think it's quite at the level of a real Sophie's Choice. We also did Snowpiercer for our Bong Joon-ho series, adapted from the French graphic novel Le Transpersonnage. Man, I love that movie. We had our two-part 1939 series that included adaptations like Gone with the Wind, Ninochka, The Women, and The Hound of the Baskervilles. A number of those 1939 movies, like Goodbye Mr. Chips, also tied into our recent 1940 Academy Award Best Picture nominee series. Our naughty children horror series had creepy adaptations like The Bad Seed, Village of the Damned, The Innocents, and Children of the Corn. For our Hayao Miyazaki series, we talked about his take on Lupin III with the Castle of Cagliostro, plus his own The Wind Rises. Some great listener choice picks, too. Viridiana and The Great Escape. And for our David Mamet Wright series, The Verdict, The Untouchables, and Glengarry Glen Ross. Plus, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang from our Shane Black series adapted from Brett Halliday's novel, Bodies Are Where You Find Them. Dive into the sources for all of these at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every book you buy helps support the show. Check out thenextreel.com slash originals today and find your next read.